Chapter 25. Big birds are evil. They charge me with razor legs. I die and it hurts. I was no stranger to stadium concerts. In ancient times, I played a dozen sold out shows at the amphitheater in Ephesus. Frenzied young women threw their strophe at me. Young men swooned and fainted. In 1965, I sang with the Beatles at Shea Stadium, though Paul would not agree to turn up my microphone. On the recordings, you can't even hear my voice on Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby. However, none of my previous experiences prepared me for the Emperor's Arena. Spotlights blinded me as we emerged from the corridor. The crowd cheered. As my eyes adjusted, I saw that we stood at the 50-yard line of a professional football stadium. The field was arranged in an odd fashion. Around the circumference ran a three-lane racetrack. Pin cushioning the artificial turf, a dozen iron posts anchored the chains of various beasts. At one post, six combat ostriches paced like dangerous merry-go-round animals. At another, three male lions snarled and blinked at the spotlights. At a third, a sad-looking elephant swayed, no doubt unhappy that she'd been outfitted in a spiked chainmail and an oversized Colts football helmet. Reluctantly, I raised my eyes to the stands. In the sea of blue seats, the only occupied section was the end zone on the left, but the crowd was certainly enthusiastic. Germani banged their spears against their shields. The demigods of Commodus' imperial household jeered and yelled insults, which I will not repeat, about my divine person. Sinocephali, the tribe of the wolf-headed men, howled and tore at their Indianapolis Colts souvenir jerseys. Rows of Blame clapped politely, looking perplexed at the rude behavior of their peers. And, predictably, an entire section of the stands was filled with wild centaurs. Honestly, you can't have a sporting event or a bloodbath anywhere without them somehow getting wind of it. They blew their vavuvulas, sounded air horns, and trampled all over one another, sloshing root beer from their double cup drinking hats. In the center of the crowd gleamed the emperor's box, bedecked in purple and gold banners that clashed horribly with the blue and steel coats decor. Flanking the throne were a grim mix of Germani and mortal mercenaries with sniper rifles. What the mercenaries saw through the mist, I couldn't guess, but they must have been specially trained to work in magical environments. They stood emotionless and alert, their fingers resting across their triggers. I didn't doubt that they would kill us at one word from Commodus, and we would be powerless to stop them. Commodus himself rose from his throne. He wore white and purple robes and a golden laurel crown, as one would expect of an emperor. But under the folds of his toga, I caught a glimpse of a golden brown racing suit. With a shaggy beard, Commodus looked more like a Gallic chieftain than a Roman, though no Gaul would have such perfect gleaming white teeth. At last, his commanding voice boomed through the stadium, amplified by giant spears that hung above the field. Welcome, Apollo! The crowd cheered and hooted. Lining the upper tiers, TV screens flashed digital fireworks and blazed the words, Welcome, Apollo! High above, along the girders of the corrugated steel roof, bags of confetti burst, dumping a snowstorm of purple and gold that swirled around the championship banners. Oh, the irony. This was exactly the sort of welcome I'd been longing for. Now I just wanted to slink back into the corridor and disappear. But of course, the doorway we'd come through had vanished, replaced with a cinder block wall. I crouched as inconspicuously as possible and pressed the indentation on my iron manacle. No wings sprang from the shackle, so I guessed I'd found the right button for the emergency signal. With luck, it would alert Joe and Emmy to our plight and location, though I still wasn't sure what they could do to help us. At least they'd know where to collect our bodies later. Meg seemed to be withdrawing into herself, rolling down her mental shutters against the onslaught of noise and attention. For a brief terrible moment, I wondered if she might have betrayed me once again, leading me right into the clutches of the triumvirate. No, I refused to believe that. And yet, why had she insisted on coming this direction? Commodus waited for the roar of the crowd to subside. Combat, combat ostriches strained at their tethers, lions roared, the elephant shook her head, as if trying to remove her ridiculous cold helmet. Meg, I said, trying to control my panic. Why did you, why are we? Her expression was as mystified as the demigods at Camp Half-Blood who'd been drawn to the Grove of Dodona by its mysterious voices. Something, she murmured, something is here. That was a horrifying understatement. Many things were here. Most of them wanted to kill us. 
The video screens flashed more fireworks along with digital nonsense like defense and make some noise and advertisements for energy drinks. My eyes felt as if they were bleeding. Commodus grinned down at me. I had to rush things, old friend. This is just the dress rehearsal, but since you're here, I scrambled to put together a few surprises. We'll restage the whole show tomorrow with a full audience after I bulldoze the way station to the ground. Do try to stay alive today, but you're welcome to suffer as much as you want. And Meg, his tisk 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 echoed through the stadium. Your stepfather is so disappointed in you. You're about to find out just how much. Meg pointed one of her swords at the emperor's box. I waited for her to issue some withering retort like, you're stupid, but the sword seemed to be her entire message. This brought back an unsettling memory of Commodus, himself in the Colosseum, tossing severed ostrich heads at the senator's seat and pointing. You are next. But Meg couldn't have known about that. Could she? Commodus' smile wavered. He held up a page of notes. So anyway, the run of the show. First, the citizens of Indianapolis are marched in at gunpoint and seated. I'll say a few words, thank them for coming, and explain how their city is now named Commodianapolis. The crowd howled and stomped. A lone air horn blasted. Yes, yes. Commodus waved away their enthusiasm. Then I send an army of Blame into the city with champagne bottles to smash against all the buildings. My banners are unfurled along with all the streets. Any bodies we retrieve from the way station are dangled on ropes from the girders up there. He gestured at the peaks to ceiling. And then the fun starts. He threw his notes into the air. I can't tell you how excited I am, Apollo. You understand, don't you? This was all preordained. The spirit of Trophonius was very specific. My throat made the sound of a vavuzula. You consulted the dark oracle? I wasn't sure my words would carry that far, but the emperor laughed. Well, of course, dear heart. Not me personally. I have minions to do that sort of thing, but Trophonius was quite clear. Once I destroy the way station and sacrifice your life in the games, only then can I rechristen the city and rule the Midwest forever as God Emperor. Twin spotlights fixed on Commodus. He ripped off his toga, revealing a one-piece racing suit of Nemean lion hide. The front sleeves decorate the front and sleeves decorated with the decals of various corporate sponsors. The crowd ooed and awed as the emperor turned to circle, showing off his outfit. You like? he asked. I've done a lot of research on my new hometown. My two fellow emperors call this place boring, but I will prove them wrong. I will stage the best Indy Colt 500 AA gladiatorial championship ever. Personally, I thought Commodus' branding needed work, but the crowd went wild. Everything seemed to happen at once. Country music blared from the speakers. Possibly Jason Aldean? Though with the distortion and reverb, even my keen ears could not be sure. At the opposite side of the track, a wall opened. Three Formula One race cars, red, yellow, and blue, like a children's toy set, rumbled onto the tarmac. Around the field, chains disconnected from the animals' collars. In the stands, wild centaurs threw fruit and blew their vuvuzelas. From somewhere behind the emperor's box, cannons fired, launching a dozen gladiators over the goalposts toward the field. Some landed with graceful rolls and came up ready to fight. Others hit the artificial turf like heavily armored spitwads and didn't move again. The race cars revved and sped around the track, forcing Meg and me onto the field to avoid getting run over. Gladiators and animals began a free-for-all, no claws bared destructo match to the Nashville beat. And then, for no logical reason, a huge sack opened under the Jumbotron monitor, spilling hundreds of basketballs onto the 50-yard line. Even by Commodus' standards, the spectacle was crass and too much of everything, but I doubted I would live long enough to write a bad review. Adrenaline raced through my system like a 220-volt current. Meg yelled and charged the nearest ostrich. Since I had nothing better to do, I raced after her, the throne of Nemesine and 30 pounds of other gear bouncing off my back. All six ostriches bore down on us. That may not sound as terrifying as a Carthaginian, Carthaginian serpent or a bronze colossus of Moy, but ostriches can run at 40 miles an hour. They charged with their metal teeth snapping, their spiked helmets swiping side to side, their barbed wire legs trampling across the turf like an ugly pink forest of deadly Christmas trees. I knocked an arrow on my bow, but even if I could match Commodus' skill, I doubted I could decapitate all six birds before they killed us. 
I wasn't even sure Meg could defeat so many with her formidable blades. I silently composed a new death haiku right on the spot. Big birds are evil. They charge me with razor legs. I die and it hurts. In my defense, I did not have much time to edit. The only thing that saved us? Basketballs ek mahina. Another bag must have opened up above us. Or perhaps a small batch of balls had gotten stuck in the netting. 20 or 30 rained down around us, forcing the ostriches to dodge and veer. One less fortunate bird stepped on a ball and took a header, planting his sharpened beak in the turf. Two of his brethren stumbled over him, creating a dangerous pileup of feathers, legs, and razor wire. Come on, Meg yelled to me. Rather than fighting the bird, she grabbed one's neck and swung onto its back, somehow without dying. She charged away, swinging her blades at monsters and gladiators. Mildly impressive, but how was I supposed to follow her? Also, she'd just rendered my uh, useless... She'd just rendered useless my plan of hiding behind her. Such an inconsiderate girl. I shot my arrow at the nearest threat, a cyclops charging me and waving his club. Where he'd come from, I had no idea, but I sent him back to Tartarus where he belonged. I dodged a fire-breathing horse, kicked a basketball into the gut of a gladiator, then sidestepped a lion who was lunging at a tasty-looking ostrich. All of this, by the way, with a chair strapped to my back. Meg aimed her deadly bird at the emperor's box, slashing down anything that got in her way. I understood her plan. Kill Commodus. I staggered after her as best I could, but my head throbbed from pounding country music and the jeering of the crowd, and the whine of the Formula One engines gaining speed around the track. A pack of wolf-headed warriors loped toward me. Too many, at too close range for my bow. I ripped off my bandolier of medical syringes and squirted ammonia in their lupine faces. They screamed, clawing their eyes, and began to crumble to dust. As any Mount Olympian custodian can tell you, ammonia is an excellent cleaning agent for monsters and other blemishes. I made my way toward the only island of calm in the field. The elephant. She did not seem interested in attacking anyone. Given her size and formidable chainmail defenses, None of the other combatants seemed anxious to approach her. Or perhaps, seeing her Colt's helmet, they simply didn't want to mess with the home team. Something about her was so sad, so despondent, I felt drawn to her as a kindred spirit. I pulled out my combat ukulele and strummed an elephant-friendly song, Primus's Southbound Pachyderm. The instrumental intro was haunting and sad, perfect for solo ukulele. Great elephant, I sang as I approached. May I ride you? Her wet brown eyes blinked at me. She huffed as if to say, whatever, Apollo. They got me wearing this stupid helmet. I don't even care anymore. A gladiator with a trident rudely interrupted my song. I smashed him in the face with my combat ukulele. Then I used the elephant's foreleg to climb onto her back. I hadn't practiced that technique since the storm god Indra took me on a late night road trip in search of Vindaloo. But I guess riding an elephant is one of those skills you never forget. I spotted Meg at the 20 yard line leaving groaning gladiators and piles of monster ash in her wake as she rode her ostrich toward the emperor. Commodus clapped with delight. Well done, Meg. I'd love to fight you, but hold that thought. The music abruptly shut off. Gladiators stopped in mid-combat. The race car slowed to an idle. Even Meg's ostrich paused and looked around as if wondering why it was suddenly so quiet. Over the speakers came a dramatic drum roll. Meg McCaffrey, Commodus boomed in his best game show announcer voice. We've got a special surprise for you. Straight from New York, someone you know. Can you save him before he bursts into flames? Spotlight beams crossed in midair at a point above the end zone, level with the top of the goalposts. That old post Findaloo feeling came back to me, burning its way through my intestines. Now I understood what Meg had sensed earlier, that vague something that had drawn her into the stadium. Suspended from the rafters by a long chain, snarling and wriggling in a rope cocoon, was the Emperor's special surprise, Meg's trusty sidekick, the Carpos Peaches.